part in the research conversation. And I'm so happy to have you all here. I'm Andrew Fanning, I'm the executive director here at Astro Theater. And gosh, this is great. This is such a great, great crowd here tonight. How many of you were here last night? I love that. Lots of people. Fantastic. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, welcome. Thank you for being here. Before we start off tonight, I just would like to first off thank our sponsors of the evening's conversation. Um, our sponsors, there are three. One is Maine Home and Design Magazine. Round of applause, please. Collector Maine, there's the next one. And our third sponsor is Country Coach Charters. I'd also like to say thank you to all of our members, the members that are here tonight, and also let those of you who are here who may not be members know that we are a nonprofit organization. Our members drive all the things that we do here, and we always appreciate their support and yours. If you're interested in becoming a member, 25 bucks for an individual, $2 off of any ticket at any time. We can come 13 times, it's still far uh, But I would really encourage you to join us. Um, we certainly appreciate your support. Um, if you have to pick up an August schedule, there's one outside as our membership envelope. So without further ado, I welcome you all here this evening to Lincoln Theater, and I will turn it over to our host, Thank you. Uh, well, I'm your host, Jane Damon. I'm an artist from Newcastle. And tonight, we have the honor of talking with one of Maine's most important artists. Indeed, he is one of the most important artists of our time anywhere. Alex Katz came onto the New York art scene in the 50s when abstract expressionism was the only accepted style for any serious painter. Wanting to go where no one had gone before and risking everything to do it, he painted a new brand of post-war realism informed by the lessons of the post-war abstract painters. His paintings involve subjects that, although representational, take on abstract universal qualities. Over the course of the past five decades, while staying true to his own vision, Alex Katz has had phenomenal success. Alex Katz, welcome to Talking Art in Maine. I'm so glad you came. Thank you. Well, uh, in keeping with Alex's wishes, we're going to show a 20-minute film of, and, and I'd like you to help us introduce the film, if you would. Tell us what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and they shot, and the painting took five hours to paint. And they shot the whole thing, and then they cut it down to 20 minutes. But five hours would be quite boring <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to watch. I'm show you a five hour movie. And I was listening to. Um, Meredith that? Monk. Meredith Monk. I had it on. And uh, uh, they liked it, and they said, well, listen, we don't need any talking. So they took the talking out, and they called up Meredith Monk and told her, and she made more. So the whole sound is, is Meredith Monk. And I was very pleased with it. They oh, did a good job. It's a great yeah. movie. And if you don't know who Meredith Monk is, she's recognized as one of the most unique and influential artists in the world of music. She's breaking all kinds of ground in that field. It's theater, too. And theater. Yeah. And she's written things, and she's, she's a friend of yours. Yeah. 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 So you're breaking new ground in art, she's breaking new yeah, ground in yeah. music, so the two go together. Um, okay, so the movie is called Five Hours. It's by Vivian Bittencourt and uh, Vincent Katz, Alex's son and daughter-in-law. Uh, it's of Alex painting one of his signature six foot by 14 foot canvases. Actually, that's a small canvas for you. That's not a real big one. No, it isn't. <laughs> Uh, called January 3rd. It's a landscape with a portrait of Ada, his wife, and Muse for the past 60 years. And it was filmed in 1992. So let's watch the movie. You can turn your chair if you want to see it.
Wow. I love that painting. Um, the swimming at the end, it looks like the fluidity of the painting in a way. Why did you add that at the end? I don't they did it. I didn't. <laughs> You swim every day. You must be in very good shape, Alex. That is a hard thing. Five hours? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say you're in very good shape. Mm -hmm. Especially, happy birthday. You're 88 years old. You look 66. <laughs> you sound really good. Um, tell us, okay, so this is a painting. You like to paint in the moment and get capture the light and the... Mm -hmm. the quickness, but you're painting something so huge, you have to have a plan, because you couldn't possibly paint. Well, it's kind of com complicated. I, I started out trying to paint instantaneous light, and so I'd make a sketch, but then I wanted to paint large paintings. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to do large figurative paintings. There, there wasn't any around, and so I sort of had to uh, adjust my ideas to what I wanted, and uh, I think painting directly, I went, uh, I had a six by six foot canvas in the middle of the road painting it, and I said, you got away with this, don't do it again. <laughs> so, so, so I started making, uh, I, guess it was a, I guess it was something, windows, I started making windows, and I do the same window every day, and it changed the image, would change and develop. And then I made large painting from the developed images. You picked one that you thought would be yeah, like... Yeah, and then try some more. So I spent a whole window doing, winter doing windows. So that got, the, then the, the process, we're starting the process more complicated. Then I started doing these large heads, faces, and I found that um, uh, if I draw on the canvas, then it's dirty, because I put my paints on real thin. So I end up using cartoons. You know, so how do you make the cartoon? Well, they, they, they make the paper the same size as the canvas. Yeah. And by that time I've done the sketches, and I, I usually do a finished drawing after the sketches, because the sketches are very quick, and then the proportions aren't the way I want them a lot of times. <clears throat> so I make a very finished drawing. That's what I was holding when I was painting. I went back to the drawing for information. And then the, the paper, uh, I, I adjust everything on the paper. On the I big can, piece of paper, yeah, like the it, Renaissance sort of yeah, cartoon like with a fresco the... technique. So what? When I finally got it, see, I can take all the time I want on the paper. I, I, you know, if it doesn't seem right, I can come yeah. back tomorrow and mm -hmm. work on it. Then I transfer it uh, to the canvas with like a pattern cutter. Oh yeah. And push powder through. Oh and yes. Then paint on paint. Paint, put the paint on top of that, so I have a drawing on there. And by, by the time I got to this one, I've, I've done about eight or seven or eight paintings like it. Mm -hmm. So the colors are all pre-mixed. Oh. And, and the technique is a wet and wet technique. Is that why you can get that very smooth, uh, your surface of the paintings yeah, that you make are with, incredibly beautiful? Very smooth. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, most large paintings are, are like patchwork quilts. Right. In technique, this is smooth. It's like glass, the surface, and it's wet and wet. So you you, you just can't do it spontaneously. You, no. you have to do it. So for the, I started out with um, just the trees, and uh, they were like four by or five by six or four by six or something like that. I did a couple of them, and then I started enlarging it. You know, going making the skies, uh, making it larger. But the technique came. The original paint thing comes from the sketch, the first sketch, mm -hmm. and I try to keep the, the the finished thing as lively as the first sketch. As lively as it is. Yeah. You see, when the wet and wet technique, you can take a black line and move it across, and it becomes like seven, eight, nine different tones. Oh. So you get a you get a very rich tonal thing with the wet and wet technique. Mm -hmm. Also, I notice when you're painting the branches, you really are in the zone. You sort of yeah. that's more intuitive. Yeah, yeah, very intuitive. Yeah. Back, I'm painting almost like I do the do the, do the thing. It's just like uh -huh. it ne it needs a lot more lines. So you were, that was like you were back at the sketch. To, back at the sketch. So yeah. that gives it life too. Yeah, because you're painting uh, uh, 
you have your internal rhythms. Like yes. the child's. Yeah. And you try to get into that zone of right. part of the painting. Right. Well, do you rest up before you do this? This is like a performance. I mean, you're, you're in there well, five I'm not, hours. Well, I'm not doing one of these every day. No. <laughs> Yeah. Do you rest up beforehand? I mean, how do you prepare? Yeah, well, for I, well I, I'm, I'm not going to do anything like this the day before, I'll tell you that. <laughs> some of them I've read you do are 12 hours. Can that yeah, be there possible? Yeah, some of them went on, uh, yeah, some when I was 40, I guess I did um, <laughs> an outdoor cocktail party. I didn't know how to do it. And I put, oh, what is it, four, five, four, five, ten hour days in. Oh. Yeah. You did them by sections. No, I, it was like with a lot of people. So I'd have the people come in, and I'd paint them, and then another person would come in. <laughs> it was really kind of uh, not an intelligent way of going about it. <laughs> well, the effect is amazing. Um, so can we go back and just start at the beginning? When you graduated from Cooper Union, it was in the 50s. Abstract Expressionism was the thing. But you decided to go against all that well, because they were already doing that. Yeah. Well, you have to realize that New York City was like a provincial city. And the ultimates was either regional painting, which I, I couldn't comprehend, <laughs> and modern art, which was the school I went to. It was a modern art school. And, um, but it was provincial modern art. It was provincial Picasso, provincial Brock, you know. and. Um, they, they're like, to me, when you go to art, they were like uh, Matisse and Picasso, great painters, and they took away a lot of your room. Took away know, a lot of the room? Well, you had no place to, you know, you had to get around them somehow. <laughs> you yeah. wanted your own thing to go. You wanted to do your own thing. Is that what you mean by yeah. you had to go well, around? you had to figure, well, you don't want to do what they did. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. basically, okay. basically it. And, uh, I wanted to go, uh, I started to paint, um, it, it would take me, when I was at Cooper Union, it would take me 18 hours to do a painting, you know? And it was like, you painted once a week. So about three weeks to do a painting, and, and the paintings I was doing were very stylish at the time. And, uh, I, you know, they were like it was the best I could do, I knew it wasn't great stuff though. And so I, I got to Skowhegan and started to paint outdoors, and I started to paint much faster. And I found uh, I was painting for my unconscious. And you so, liked that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that so was what you the wanted. Get, uh, the things get assimilated. It's like you learn how to. Uh, well, I started out like with cast drawing. Uh, with cast drawing in high school, I went to a high school that was like a trade school, but I could draw antique every afternoon. So I drew antique, and antique drawing is, you spend three hours putting dots to measure, you oh. know? Yeah. And then the next day you connect the dots. Boring. Three hours, yeah, another three hours. And then the third day you light your white, your dark, huh. and your light tones. And the fourth day you put in your secondary tones. And the fifth day you put technique on it so it looks a little easy. <laughs> And it's okay. So it's very measured, and you have to think all the way through it. But when you, when that comes, that becomes part of your unconscious. Yeah, it's good training. Yeah, it was, it was good for me. Yeah. But it becomes part of your unconscious. So when you draw, all of that comes is digested by your unconscious, mm -hmm. and you're sort of drawing almost like a child. But you have all that stuff uh, to lo go back. Yeah, yeah, and, and the same with so. uh, the modern art. Uh, the uh, antique drawing is, is the basis of cubism, hmm. in, in a sense, it comes right out of it. And when I was studying uh, in, in, in uh, Cooper Union, it was in Bauhaus and cubism. And the uh, teacher would say that the same sentences that the antique teacher said, don't break, don't break up dark harmony with a light, open up an edge, and it was the same language. And, and so for me, uh, the cubism, uh, cubism was very easy. Hmm. Uh, most of the kids were struggling, and for me it was like pie because of the other thing. So the cubism became absorbed. It was mm. just another, for mm -hmm. me, for, for the teacher, it was truth. You know, they believed in it. And I, for me, it was like antique drawing, which antique drawing was completely useless. 
<laughs> so when you went out in nature, you didn't think, but yeah, this stuff thing, came I was up. Yeah, trying to paint as quick as I could, and and get, try to work from the unconscious, mm -hmm. and trying to make images. Mm -hmm. That that was it. And the, what I found there was the process uh, of painting was what I found. The paintings were no better or worse than what I was doing in school. The school paintings were like fashionable, and these paintings weren't. But one was as good or as bad as the other. So I had made a solution. And then you get into the thing of, um, the, I got into the thing of Pandora's box, which is, what's realistic in a painting? And you say, well, Rembrandt's don't look realistic to me. <laughs> you know, Impressionist paintings don't look, what, is, what does look realistic? And then it becomes, uh, a can of worms. You just keep trying different things, and I guess the the show in the uh, at Colby. Colby shows me trying different things. Right. Trying to trying to figure out a way of making something realistic, and then you get to the point where you realize that uh, well, you you go to this thing like you, you think you see with your eyes. It's true. It's false. You see culturally. Culturally. You only see in the culture you live in. And it's always changing. It's, mm -hmm. What you see changes every 20 years. So uh, it's sort of up for grabs, and any solution you make will be obsolete. <laughs> in 20 years. <laughs> in 20 years. <laughs> You're left with a painting. <laughs> but and, that's OK. Yeah, it's OK. <laughs> yeah. But that's, that's, that, that's the way it goes. So paintings don't evolve. They kind of change. They change, yeah. And well, so, it doesn't get any, nothing gets any better, yeah. that's for sure. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it, it, it says the old, modern, the old modernist thing is like they believed in progress in painting, you know. But that's now it seems like a silly idea. <laughs> There's no progress. <laughs> it's just like changing. Well, how did you? You came out of school. You were about twenty. You yes. had incredible. Uh, fortitude and courage to go against the tide because everybody said don't do what you're doing yeah. it's crap the first, they actually said the that came over, the first painting I showed a teacher came over and said Alex uh, uh, figuration is obsolete and color is French <laughs> <laughs> and what did you say well, I said to my, I said to my, I didn't say anything. I'm, I'm very polite, but I'm yeah. thinking that's to you, Buster. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that gave you more determination. I mean, it might oh, have yeah. demolished someone else, but yeah, they, how, where did you get that inner resolve at a young demolish. age? I, don't, I have no idea. <laughs> you were brought up by uh, yeah. Parents were pretty independent yes. thinkers. That, that, they helped a lot, I guess, but uh, I don't know. Uh, it's either it goes that works that way or it falls down. Yes, yeah. That was the way I, it was. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so I had you... no idea halfway through, about three or four years out of school, whether the stuff was any good, but I know it yeah. wasn't conventional. It, right. And uh, to me, any any second generation AE guy was conventional. Any any guy doing abstract yeah. expressionism yeah, it was, was my conventional. Age. It was more conventional. Okay. You know? So you were doing something different. I was doing something different. So but you were totally poor. You lived in a cold water flat. You didn't have any heat. You couldn't even vote because you weren't. <laughs> you weren't a legitimate. I mean, you weren't living in a, a, a legal place. No, I lived illegally for about fifteen years. <laughs> so how did you keep? So there again, it's well, that result. Well, you kept going and uh, yeah. hoping something. I did have a small, small audience. Uh, paint, some painters like my work and. They were here and they had people encouraged me. Oh, Lenny Bakula, the guy who made paints, uh -huh. when I was an art student, he came over and said, hey Alex, if you ever need any paints, come to my shop. Hmm. So I went there and I got some paints. I never paid for paints. And he said, well, give me a painting once in a while. Oh, that was good So he deal. kept me for 20, 30 years in paint. <laughs> wow. Anytime I want painting, give me paint. And, he'd take and you had some uh, friends who were critics and poets yeah, who that, liked your work. Yeah, that was at the end. Not then, not in the beginning. Not in the beginning. Nobody liked your work in the beginning. No, a couple of people did. Yeah. <laughs> not too many. <laughs> not too many. Uh, but you, but you, I would recommend that you go over to Colby and look at the show because it's so different from the work we're seeing at this, on this film. But you can see that he's struggling. And I heard that you tore up a thousand oh, yeah, paintings I, 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 while you were struggling to find your voice. Well, yeah, you know, I didn't see any point in keeping around. <sighs> 
That is stick to it. Well, my, te my technique got very good. <laughs> I guess it would. Yeah, that was it. I wanted to be able to paint um, like, a, 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 like a real master, master technician. You know? Well, you do You just do it over and over and yeah. again, and you develop a big technique. Yes. I like the technique of, uh, the big technique of um, Matisse. Uh -huh. And I think Picasso's technique got big when he, when he was about 50. His technique got great. Before that, he made great paintings, but he didn't have a real big technique. Hmm. And I wanted that big technique, and you just do it over and over again. And you get it, finally. Well, I was lucky. <laughs> I don't know if it was luck. I think you stuck to it. Um, you said at one point, convention scared the hell out of me. I had to make up how to live. I had to do it myself. Yeah, I had to make it up, yeah. Well, hell, I, I knew I didn't, well, friends were all getting married, and some families and stuff like that, and I knew it wasn't what I wanted. You all. wanted a yeah, big technique. I didn't technique. want that, no. Because what happened was, <clears throat> I didn't have, I don't think I had natural talent, so I, I, I grew antique for three years and got a lot better. And the other things I was involved in, I never got much better. And I found that if I put concentrated energy into something, I would get, I got better. So when I finished high school, I could draw an antique drawing as well as any, 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 any adult. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're really first class as far as I was concerned. Mm. And they have a place in, in New York where they teach it. And my, my student stuff is better than the teachers. Mm. You know? I had a very good teacher. Uh, so if I got that much better, if I ever got in, if I got into Cooper Union, which is mm -hmm. hard, hard to get into, and when I got in, they were like one third of the class was from music and art of prep school, and the other third was re was returning veterans, and most of them had been in Cooper, and I was in the other third. And the high school I went into, uh, if you sat in your seat, you got an eighty. <laughs> If it showed up. It was pretty wild, really wild. Place. But you could paint all afternoon on that one. Yeah, but weird. I was able to learn how to do the antique drawings. And I didn't need the, uh, the, the uh, I, I was, uh, I finished my English before. I didn't need it. I didn't need any of this stuff. Mm. So when I got into Cooper, I was way behind. And I figured that if I got in, I must have a very high aptitude, mm -hmm. intellectually, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I think will you pass do. the rest of the class. In a year and a half, and that's just what happened. You did pass the yeah, rest passed, of the class. Passed everyone about a year and a half. What, something you said reminded me of a quote that I wrote down. It's, art is work. Creativity can be taught because it depends on grit and ambition as much as talent. Do you believe that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So a, lot of people have, a lot of people have more talent than I have, more natural ability. But, uh, uh, but you were determined. Well, determined and ambitious. Yeah. And both ambitious. Of, both of those things, yeah. <laughs> so fun to I talk to you. You're so honest. What? I never was intimidated by by good painting. <laughs> Who's making that? Is that me? Oh, what am I doing? Oh, it's my scarf. Sorry. I'll I'll sit stiller. Um, okay. So then, in the '60s, you wanted to make paintings. A l but first, I don't want to stop. I want to stop for just a minute and tell you. Go to Colby and see the show. It's only an hour from here, and it is a great show because it, it shows all of these things Alex was experimenting with. Photographs you were using to yeah. paint from. Yeah. and Photographs was a no-no. Yeah, nobody admitted to using them. Yeah. But you were admitting it. I was putting it right in your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and everything you were doing was different. Uh, yeah. Painting things that people said, oh, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Leaving all the background flat. Things well, like that. That was the that was I guess the big the big stylistic thing in, yeah. in, in my life was the flat backgrounds and the yes. figures, and uh, I think uh, uh, it, it was like De Kooning had a figure in ground thing. A figure in ground. Yeah, that was the idea. The figure in the ground. His solution was cubist. Oh, okay. And De Kooning, the expression, uh, yeah. abstract expression. Yeah, abstract expression, but it's basically cubist. And uh, he's a terrific painter, terrific yes. guy. And uh, I had enough of cubism. You, you know, didn't want to do that. I didn't, I didn't want to. I wanted to get away from that, like cast drawing. Like cast drawing. I want to go in another area. So, what is the subject of your paintings? Is it the paint itself? Is it the appearance? The well, style? I think there's two things. Uh, yeah, the style's a big. The style's the content of the painting, really. And I think the painting is uh, time and light. 
time and light. That's a big thing. It's like trying to get in the immediate present. And yeah. the idea is uh, um, there is uh, this, uh, eternity exists in the immediate present. That's it. You sound like a spiritual guru. Well, that's what it is. It's, it comes yeah. from uh, the, yeah. that's in uh, uh, Gertrude Stein writes that in, mm -hmm. in no narrative mm -hmm. idea. She did it for her poetry, which isn't very good. But the idea is, <laughs> and Saint Augustine said the same thing too. Yeah, a lot of spiritual people. Say. It's not an original idea. Yeah, but you you really felt it. Well, I felt that's what I wanted to get in the immediate <laughs> present. You know, well somehow music gets into the present tense, but painting always seems like. Uh, behind or intellectual, it's, it's not in the present tense. Well, you said once that you paint from the back of your head. What does that mean? Well, it's, you're, you're painting automatically, you're trying to paint automatically, like, like what you saw when you painted. Oh, without thinking? Without thinking, yeah. Okay. You have an idea and you have an image you want, and the way you go about it is uh, from the back of your head. And then they make a sketch and then I sort of say what I like about it and what I don't like about it. Why do you cut off some, for instance, this painting, whoops, I'm sorry, yeah. making oh. noises again. That painting of, of Ada in the middle of the two trees, you wanted to cut her face. Yeah, well, uh, I started cutting things. Yeah. In, in, when, when I did the cutouts, it was, um, uh, uh, sculpture ends in conventional places. Here, here. Oh, yeah. Right? All oh, right. And so I said, with cubism, you, you, you take uh, space and put it in front of people. Space. Oh, you take a space in, in the people. background and you stick it in front of a person. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And so uh, I start cutting it in places that weren't uh, weren't conventional. Like the sides of the, the face. side of a head or <laughs> cut it right off here or cut it here. And the space goes right up next to it, you know? Yes. That, like a billboard. Yeah, it's like a billboard and things pop up and it's kind of different looking. Yeah. And kind of uh, has some energy. Has energy. Energy is yeah. the big deal. That's what you were looking for, yeah, that punch kind of, or that um, huge deal. Real, real energy. And with the big pictures, it was, uh, 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 Picasso couldn't paint a big picture to save the soul. He couldn't. No. His paintings were all much smaller, all smaller than yours. When he painted big, I'm a granite for me isn't, 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 isn't. Isn't is as a, big as yours. No, but it's a big piece of graphic art. It's interesting. Yeah. But it hasn't got the punch of a big picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you see a Veronese, it sort of takes off. It's huge. Yeah, very nice. And there's some Pollocks that are awesome. Yes. They got so much juice, you know? Yeah. And so you were looking for the juice. Yeah, I was looking for something that really had some sock to and it. And you also, you are into symbols. Now, tell us the difference between, like, pop art was more about signs. And signs. So how is yours different? Well, a sign is uh, blue sky, black road. Black road stop. or stop sign. Stop. Yeah. Go. Go. That's a sign. It's, 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 it refers to one thing. Or a can of soup. Yeah, well, it refers to just a can of soup. Yeah. Well, when you have a, the, a symbol, it's a person, then all of a sudden it's a beautiful lady. And all of a sudden it moves. It becomes different things. So it's people. a real person, but it's also a universal person. Well, it also becomes different things. It can become like a, a, a beautiful, like, like, it can be a, a man. A particular man, then it can be a beautiful man. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it could stand for some and, yeah, different things. Yeah, it could things. be a, a stylish man, or it mm -hmm. could be a, a, not, not a stylish. And so a symbol moves around. Right. Is it a cultural thing? Yeah. A symbol well, it's involved in uh, the uh -huh. the images are a lot of them are cultural. Yeah. So um, I have some other questions before we open it up to the audience. I've got so many questions here. Um, so you de-emphasize content. Content yeah. doesn't matter to you. You're interested in the surface. The surface. And the style. And the immediate, the, yeah, the immediate, the immediate punch of the picture. Well, the old guys, the AE guys, they, they, they said, you take subject matter and turn it into content. And you take the content and turn it into form. And it seemed there was something missing. You didn't like the, the story that went no, with I it. I didn't like the aesthetics at all. And so I said, well, listen, the, the style is my content. But some of your paintings, Alex, when I look at mm -hmm. them, I see some kind of a psychological thing going on, but you didn't intend that. It happened because, but you didn't mean that. Well, the that. things happen in the paintings that I have no control over. They just pop yeah. up. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I can see those psychological things. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. okay. But you didn't intend those. That wasn't your intention when you made the painting. 
No. No. Um, oh, talk about how music has influenced you. Well, like the Stan Getz and uh, you know, the jazz and all that. Well, you had, um, in, in, in the 50s, there was a basically, uh, uh, people say dealers make the style, you know, or museum people make it. It's not that at all. It's a great big cultural wave that goes all over, and, and, it, and it's, um, and you get hooked, you get want to be part of the wave. That's, that's what it is. And it, like in the 50s, you had um, Faulkner writing uh, nonlinear, mm -hmm. and you had bebop, which was nonlinear, mm. and you had abstract expressionism, which was nonlinear, and there was poets that were nonlinear, and, and classical music was all nonlinear, not with a line. And it, it's a thing, uh, it has to do with change. Hmm. You know, it has, it's no progress anymore. Progress it's belongs in the 40s. <laughs> <laughs> you know, prog progress belongs with um, ideas about communism and fascism and modern art. They all thought about themselves as being progressive. Oh. But there is no progress, it's just change. Just change. And, and these people who think of art as being very serious cannot believe that art is like fashion where they change the hemline every year. And you like fashion. You, yeah, you no, started no, painting fashion. fashion. Yeah. And yeah. people criticize you for that. But yeah, you they, they, like, they, like, uh, they believe in, there is a solution for art that's eternal and a solution for, that, you know. Serious, fixed. eternal. And, and my feeling it's all variable. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's change, not progress. And sometimes it's better aesthetically and sometimes it's not better aesthetically, you know? Yeah. And uh, uh, Balanchine had this great comment that he said, with the classical ballet, which of course is ballet is related to fashion, he mm. said, with the classic ballet, you have to change the hemline every year. <laughs> which I just thought was great. He, he's one of the great thinkers of the 20th century. Balanchine. Yeah, in, in aesthetics. Yeah, yeah. uh-huh. So, but you did get to know some designers, and you actually had models and used the show yeah, well, clothes and painted them. Yeah, well, I did. Uh, fashion was a no-no, like photography. And so I said, "Let's go." <laughs> I love that attitude. Um, so, is there ever an agreement on quality in art? Yeah, well, well more or less, but it's, but it, but it changes, you know. <laughs> so there's okay, no agreement. Okay. I'm in art school, and at that time, everyone thinks El Greco was the greatest thing since Toast. El Greco. At, in the late 40s, El Greco was like the greatest thing since Toast. Yeah. And I didn't, I had no art history background, so the summer, all I did was read art history books. So I got all the books I could on El Greco, mm -hmm. and they were very little, and they usually said he, was, he had an astigmatism, and he was a second class painter. <laughs> Any book before before the 20th century thought of El Greco as a, a real minor painter huh. with something wrong with his eyes. <laughs> and in the 40s, he was considered, considered better than Velasquez. Yes. You know. So it changes with. It changes. You know, he went down, and now he's now they bring yeah. him back up again. Right. And I think it, it, I think all art has variables. Some, uh, uh, if art is complicated, it can move through time. Mm -hmm. If it's simple, it just belongs to the time it's made. Oh. So, words, how do you think not, your art will appear well, in 30 years seems, from now? Well, it seems to move. It moves? Yeah, it seems yeah. to move, you know. Because people, uh, when, when, they, when they first started doing the, the flat backgrounds and the flat, flat people, mm -hmm. uh, they said it's cold and heartless. <laughs> you know, the stuff is very icy, cold and heartless. And uh, 40 years later, they said, these paintings are like Modigliani. <laughs> I said, wow. <laughs> quite a switch there, yeah, quite, quite a flip. A, quite, quite a change. Yeah, yeah. And things are perceived differently. Yes. As, as with uh, all of us, we have taste. You have some things you like, right? You know you like. Mm. And other things you don't know. And some things you don't think you know. And then, and then all of a sudden, you like them. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. It's always moving. Yeah. And, and to um, believe in uh, values of move, shifting values moving, 
is to uh, make a lot of uncertainty. And that's part of the problem with the world. What? That we don't live in well, uncertainty? Yeah, of course. Uh, we, uh, we're not we, comfortable we, with it. In the United States, we'd say, like, the Ten Commandments are, are, are okay. In other words, they're not perfect. They don't cover, you don't cover everything accurately. And um, it, it doesn't give you, uh, you know, the belief, you, you don't have any comfort in knowing things, things are variable. Yeah, you so it's hard to live. Uh -huh, and, the, uh, and to um, uh, give yourself some comfort, you want a, a, a fixed world. Yep. And the fixed world is, is, is part of the problems we have. People have a fixed, fixed position, mm -hmm. and they're trying to impose it on other people, their fixed position. So, so what we should be comfortable with looking for is the unknown, not the known. Well, yeah, words, you know, you deal with variables. Things yeah, come along, and yeah, you yeah. sort of have to change. Have to kind of go with yeah, the flow. Go with the flow. Are you, do you see yourself as an American painter? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it turned out that way. In, in, in Europe, when I first showed, they thought I was a bad pop artist or, or a bad photorealist. They couldn't make up for which way I was bad. <laughs> but you were bad. <laughs> yeah. And in, in the 90s, it all shifted. The 90s? I, yeah. They, they, in the 90s, they liked you now. Yeah. Oh, they really love me there. Now yeah. they like you Better a lot. than here. Better than here. They, oh, really? Yeah. Could, they say I'm the quintessential American painter, and my painting relates to old master painting. Mm, and it does. Yeah, and they, actually, they, and yeah, my painting's traditional, actually, and uh, a, a, a lot of the um, uh, pop art it's not a, it's not doesn't relate to mm, traditional mm, painting much. Mm. Um, I have to ask this because we live in Maine, but I know you love the style of the people in New York, and you get a lot of mm -hmm. excitement from the New York. What do you find so compelling about well, Maine? Well, I, I always feel free here. Free. And, uh, free. Well, you know, a lot of things. One thing is, if, if I, I grew up in Queens in the suburbs, mm -hmm. and if I put an easel out inside of the paint, they said, there's that crazy cat's kid. <laughs> 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 you know, he's nuts. Yeah. And I can put an easel up here, and I'm, I'm like a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a carpenter, there's a plumber, there's a painter. There's so many <laughs> painters around here. <laughs> And uh, there was a plumber who ran into me. I hadn't seen him in 20 years. He said, hey, Alex, how you doing? I said, I'm okay. He said, are you still painting? I said, I try to keep my hand in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. I had a question. Now I've forgotten it. Uh, well, let's open up the floor to questions. Do we have any questions out there? I can't see without the lights being up. But there's a question back there. I can't hear what you're saying. Is Sidney Tillam in one of your yeah, early on paintings? A, a, a Sidney Tillam is on a table. The one flight up. One flight up. Oh, it's a it's a cutout. Cutout thing. Do you know him? I did, yeah. Ah. Mm -hmm. Question right here. Three or four of your favorite artists and why are they your favorites? Oh, you mean like now? Like right now? Anytime. What? What did you say? Last two centuries. Last two centuries? <laughs> that gives you some freedom here. Uh, uh, I like uh, Tutmus. Tutmus, who's he? He's the guy who did Nefertiti. <laughs> he's, he's my all time. He's your all time favorite? Uh, yeah, he's my all time favorite. Because yeah. Nefertiti is a person, but she's a universal person. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. And it's so elegant, the styling is so elegant. And he has a great line, and he models like Raphael. You mm. know, if you see his small things when he models, it's just unreal. I think he's an unreal artist. Mm. And he seemed to me uh, closer to me than uh, in, in, um, uh, Closer to me than a lot of modern artists. Really? <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, yeah. Or contemporary artists, even. Mm -hmm. Any contemporary artists that you yeah, are? I think, I think Peter Deutsch's real good, and I think Marlene Dum Dumas is really, really good painters. I mean, they're interesting paintings. I love looking at them. You've done a great thing at Colby, where you went through their collection and picked out things that you thought were really good, and they had a show of them, and yeah, you said Peter why yeah. why yeah. you like them. You've got great insight into people's paintings and something different 
that always catches yeah, you. Yeah, well, it's, it's like uh, uh, that, that show that we did, that was years and years ago. Mm. And they wanted to see, uh, you have a lot of people in, in uh, Maine painting, but you don't have a lot of uh, current information. What do you up. mean? Well, people are doing new paintings that you, you don't have access to. Yes, yeah, but you do at Colby. <laughs> yeah, well, well, that show I picked out uh, yeah. a lot of new painters. Mm -hmm. uh, other questions? Yes. I haven't been there in 10 years. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong information. Ah, anyway, well, maybe they were talking about a, a, a mythic. A what? You're mythic. You've become mythic. Mythic. Well, that's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> what he said, you said was. <laughs> Although you weren't there. Oh, you weren't there then. Okay. That's great. <laughs> There. That there should be more younger oh, artists at Skowhegan? No, I told the, the, I told the director that. I told the director they should, oh. they should, because what they do, uh, they give scholarships, and they usually, when they pick the scholarship, they pick the best art, and it's, and a lot of times it's for people who are 35 who should be out on the street, <laughs> you know, and uh, younger people don't get the breaks, and I think I, I thought it would be more diverse, and uh, mm. to have. Uh, a proportion of younger people to older people. How old were you when you first went there? 22, I think. Yeah. Makes sense? Yeah. Anybody? Over here. I painted Ada a lot of times. They had a show, it was like 250, that was a long time ago. But the uh, the painting of it has to do with painting, it doesn't have to do with Ada. Right, but that stroke though. That, that's, that's the paint, the, the, the stroke has to do with painting. Right, but it must be... Uh, it hasn't to do with Ada, I'm sure. If it was some other face, I'd be doing the same strokes. Yeah. That's technique. The same line of for the eyebrow. Yeah. And the changes because it's very different in each painting. But I, I think that's a, a, a wonderful experience to experience over time. Mm -hmm. And I understand the exciting painting. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I've got a lot, of, a lot of terrific pictures of Ada. She's a terrific model. <laughs> but uh, the painting's the painting. Uh, over here. Now, if we go to Colby, um, should, uh, is there a problem you may talk about change? Is there a series of paintings there that would show this change to the extent of the Is there a series at the Colby show of paintings that will show this change? It's well, not yeah, really this like change is, is from the beginning of it to the end of the show, there's a real change. You can just see it developing, you can figure it out. And when you see the paintings, they don't even, a lot of people don't think I, they don't look like I did them. But when you see the, at the end, when I get to the flat backgrounds, then it, it makes sense, you know? Mm -hmm. Is that right? I think so, mm -hmm. but I mean, I didn't notice a huge change, not like this. No, I didn't get up to this side. Yeah. But, uh, the painting was pretty small in the, in, the, in, the, in the 40s and 50s. I think I got up to, Four by six, by the end of the, of the 50s, about like that. And I have one painting there that's about, I went up to six, six, or six foot square or something like that at the end of the 50s, of the end of the 50s, yeah. I, I got up to 10 by 20 feet in the 60s, real quick. The size, is op the size was an open area. I like his oil paintings. He paints real well. I like his etchings. And uh, he was what was fashionable when I was young, so I disliked his work. You know, but when you put one of those watercolors at 20 feet, they really, they really have some, 
They really have a lot of carrying power. So I think he was one of the best artists here, but it was like for me, uh, when I think about it, I think, well, they're, they're like provincial, basically provincial cubism, but he had a great touch with paint. What about Miles Van Hartley? I love uh, his work. Hartley for me is big time. Yeah, I love his work. Yeah. Well, that looks more universal. Yeah, well, he can, you can put him next to European painting. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. whereas I, I think with with with, with Marin, uh, you can't put it next to a good Picasso. Mm -hmm. You know, right here. I'm not sure what my question is exactly, but you talked a lot about Maury, and when I saw the Kobe show, I kept thinking, God, he can draw. And anything more you want to say about drawing? About drawing. Oh well, I, I did the, the antique drawing, and then when I went to Cooper, I couldn't draw from life at all. You know, I mean, they'd have a they'd have a 20 minute session, and I get one line on, and the teacher finally came over and said, "Get a bigger pad." And I said, "I'm going to get kicked out of this place <laughs> if I don't do something." So to learn how to draw, I got a pad, and I drew around the clock. In other words, if I wasn't eating, I was drawing. <laughs> if I was coming home from a day to four in the morning, I was drawing. I filled the whole closet full of pads of drawings. And at the end of about two and a half or three years, I could draw, you know? Yeah. And uh, it was just like, I, uh, I found early on, if I put energy into something, I get something back. And uh, drawing is like riding a bicycle. Anyone can do it. You just got to put the energy into it. But it seems to really inform your painting. It really yeah. informs your painting. Yeah, but I had to get away from drawing. And so the early paintings were... Uh, uh, the drawing is kind of more casual, so, so I went from drawing to painting, and I wanted to, I didn't want it to be, drawing um, has a way of containing forms, and I wanted them to go open. So I pretty much uh, threw drawing out and just painted, and then um, when I cooled off, I started to do finished drawings in uh, 19, about 1960, and I was surprised at how good I was. <laughs> really, I was shocked. And, and Edwin and Rudy came over and they said, we didn't know you could draw. <laughs> Edwin Denby yeah, and Rudy yeah, Berkner. Yeah, they came by and said, we didn't know you could draw. And I said, I didn't either. <laughs> Talk more about open. What do you mean by that? Well, like uh, Picasso and Matisse, uh, uh, their, their paintings are descriptive in form, and they make comp uh, solid form. Now, Jackson Pollock just opened it up. And Bonard opened it up. Bonard. Yeah, Bonard and Pollock just opened it up. They 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 spread. They, they don't, oh, beyond the edge yeah, of the. Yeah, the whole thing opens up, and uh, uh, Pollock leads you into a Venetian painting, you know, real big open mm. painting, mm. and uh, that was a way for me to get away from Picasso and Matisse. You know? So because Bonard doesn't have um, forms that are, are finished, the, yeah, it's well, more not, open. They're not, they're not constricted or descriptive. Yeah, yeah, I see. He has a field of light. I love the color. Yeah, it's, it's a color just, of light. It's, and it doesn't really contain it does, anything. It doesn't contain anything. I it's, see. It's, it's, it's very, um, um, what do you call it, um, uh, artificial. It looks yeah. like it's realistic, but it's all made up. Yeah, it, it doesn't relate to the thing no, that it's, it's supposed not, not, to be not, not, describing. It's not, it's, yeah. not the, uh, it's neither descriptive or uh, right. uh, trying to capture a, a sensation like Monet, you know? Right. So you were trying to do that with your yeah, paintings. Yeah, and then all of a sudden Monet becomes interesting, and uh, you're looking at different things. Mm hmm For different reasons, yeah. Have you been to the night vision exhibition at Bowdoin? No. Okay, one of your paintings is in the exhibition. I have a painting in the exhibition? <laughs> <laughs> Which one? New York night, night scene you, is your yeah. painting. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of night paintings. He did a lot of night paintings. What's interesting is that in that room, there are paintings of these major artists, but they're not the conventional way you think of them, George O'Keefe, Norman Vincent, Jackson Pollock. Right. 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 Right.
Mm. And I think there's a nice scene in New York. Uh, but anyway, I was just wondering if I recommend it. <laughs> go see it. Go see your painting. <laughs> Do you know what nocturne in music is? No. What is uh, it? It's a it's a romantic. The nocturne. title is Night Vision. Yeah. Nocturne is romantic. And <laughs> not nocturne is romantic. <laughs> Mark Morris. The choreographer. Oh, yeah. oh, oh. I didn't work with him. I worked with Paul Taylor. I did a lot of backdrops for uh, Paul Taylor. Paul Taylor, yeah. Mm -hmm. You did paintings of him too. Yeah. And you you did backdrops and sets with sets him. Sets and costumes. Yeah. Yeah. Was that a fun time for you? Oh yeah. It was yeah. Really amazing. Is it was he? Like a, Rauschenberg was the. Uh, the, the great set designer of the time. Rauschenberg. Yeah, yeah. he did these Merce Cunningham things. They're really fabulous. Wow. And uh, he, he, he was doing something with Paul. It was the, uh, and it was, uh, there's a still life like this table with bottles on it. And then the still life gets up and it's Paul Taylor. It's on the back of Paul Taylor. <laughs> Walks around right. the stage. Right, and so Paul said, I'm not going to dance with any still life on my back, and Rauschenberg <laughs> says, how can you say no to such a great idea? <laughs> and so they parted company, and he had to go to Spoleto in, in two weeks or a week, and, and Edward Denver was a friend of his and, my, and me, and he said, I think, I think Alex can make sets, hmm. just like that. And, and you, took, you did it? I did it, and it worked. You loved it because it was so weird. To do sets? No, it was real natural. No, but I mean, you, did, you like things that are so different. Well, it was it was it was pretty strange. Paul Paul is pretty strange, and <laughs> no, but it worked out, and and so uh, we just kept doing them, and we, we had, had a lot of fun. And it's it's uh, it's like it, for me, it's just like a painting. You know, it has that kind of energy in it, and a collaborative. You know, when it works, it's just absolutely. Uh, you have so much energy; it's mm -hmm. unreal. It's very different, though, because you've got all these different factions working together. Yeah, and, and, if it, and but it's right. You know where it is. It, it doesn't have to wait ten years. <laughs> okay, lots of hands here. Uh, I have a question about the um, uh, when it was just on again about the uh, your painting of flesh, and you said that you mix the paint ahead of time. Mm -hmm. The flesh is it's the flesh in that painting is a single tone over the whole face, uh -huh. and then the secondary tones are put into that wet paint and mixed on the canvas. Uh -huh. it, it looks kind of smooth, but that's that's how it's done. It's beautiful color. Yeah, that one worked out really, great. really well. Work out that great. <laughs> Yeah, well, that was the, the, the hat. The hat I knew, I, that was the amount of paint for the hat. And I, I, didn't, I didn't think of taking anything home. <laughs> right here. Gerhard Richter. Gerhard Richter. Gerhard Richter, I think, paints very well. And, but the styling for me is like a Buick. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, just what I said. <laughs> Explain. A, a Buick is a nice middle class vehicle. And that's what? That's what I think of Gerard Richter. Nice, <laughs> nice middle class painting. Okay. He's very skilled. And, very skilled. Uh, very talented. And there's a nice movie on him. But uh, I don't, don't think of it as having uh, the elegance of uh, Tutmus. Or the excitement? Does it have excitement? Mm -hmm. Or some, punch tech, or? Tech, tech, some of the stuff is, uh, mm. is it, it has a thing of it. Um, it engages people. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. 
that engages people uh, on that level. Uh, you know. Mm -hmm. But isn't it funny how he did the two different styles? He kept those two things going. Well, I think I think what happened is um, the merchandising of painting or the promotion of painting in modern painting starts with the impressionists. You know? Merchandising. Yeah, so they, they were successful, so then they all of a sudden were the, the foes, and then this, and then that. And it's kind of an artificial way of, of uh, promoting uh, painting that seems obsolete at this time. You mean lumping it together as a group? Yeah, lump with groups. It's a group thing. We are, we are the abstract expressionists. Yeah. Uh -huh. you know? And what happened is uh, we went into a time of variables, and boys uh, started to do all kinds of different things. Boys? Boys, yeah. More, more different than other people. And he opened the door for other people. For, you know, for people being able to say, well, I feel like painting abstract today, why can't I? You know, whereas uh, abstract is art and figuration is not. So uh, Rick to study with boys, and he, he comes out of those that idea. Oh, I can, see what you mean. Yeah. An artist yeah. can do whatever he wants I to. I see, yeah. You know? And it seems to me uh, as, as le legitimate as truth. Hmm. Back there. I was wondering if you have seen the Mark Rothko uh, paintings at the Harvard Museum uh, where they have to be shown under ultraviolet light because they decay so much. And, and your thoughts on this place? Who's, who's the owner? Mark Rothko's paintings at the Harvard Museum, and I think Mark Rothko said he wanted them hung in a certain way, and they've de they've deteriorated because of the light. Oh, they deteriorated because of the crummy paints he used. Ah, <laughs> what did he use? He's a real crummy paint. I got all his paints when he died. Oh, what he are they? I had the restorer, and I threw I threw half of them out. <laughs> he he wanted the right color, and he didn't care whether it was going to be uh, permanent. Oh. So they had a lot of trouble. He had a lot of trouble with the. Um, he, he's a fabulous artist, but he he, he uh, doesn't uh, the technique uh, structurally they're not sound paintings. He used thin thin layers and layers on top of layers, and he used some paints that were, were fugitive. Uh, fugitive means they're not going to hold their color in 20 years. Wow. No. That's not good. Well, I don't know. Well, you wouldn't like want your colors to. What, what do you no, mine think? Are very, my paintings are very sound. Yeah. But, uh, like Pollock did things that were like uh, uh, not structurally sound, but it Pollock. seemed to work out. Mm. You know, a lot of those things were not structurally sound. All of a sudden, look, they look okay. Mm. But I think because he painted very direct. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, direct painting uh, holds up much better than layered painting. Oh. Because it's thicker? No, of course, it, 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 it all dries at once. Oh. What, you talk about what? I use what third, medium I, I, you use? The, 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 there, there, there are a whole bunch of things. I use thirds, pretty much. You know, thirds are classic. It's a uh, turp, linseed oil, and varnish. Uh, how, what you paint on is as important as what you put on it. So the, the, the canvas ground. were very carefully prepared. The ground. The grounds, yeah. What do you use for uh, grounds? We paint, we, 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 I, paint, we, we, I make the own, uh, all the things, all the paintings are, of mine from from Colby on to now, I, well, they're, they're, they're handmade grounds. Really? What yeah. do you make them out of? Well, it has... Uh, 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 Rabbit skin glue? Yeah, we put glue on it because I like the way it looks and they can take it off. Then we put uh, th three coats of um, uh, gesso and two coats of oil. So you have a real, you have, they're really white. And, and, and why the oil on top of that? To, is it, well, does it give it depth? Oil, the oil is sort of, has a nice uh, transparency. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean the oil paint? Oh yeah, the oil painting holds the paint on the surface. Mm. And so, uh, if you look on, on one of my paintings from like a 15 degree angle to the, to the painting, mm -hmm. it's absolutely like smooth as glass. Mm. They're done very, they're done in one shot and the paint doesn't sink in, it just stays on there. Yeah, it's true. They are really unusual. I've never seen other paintings that look no, that No, there's no one, smooth. yeah. The biggest thing, I, 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 like the one thing I know is my, 
my surface is impeccable, mm -hmm. and it's a better surface than than. It's you know, true. Yeah, it's a twenty foot painting like glass. How can you do it? I mean, that is amazing. That is what you you That's do this Herculean is. thing where you stay there until it's done. Yeah, you it just, doesn't dry. Yeah, until it it's dries done. all at once, and yeah. uh, it's done all at once, and it has a ground under it that takes more time to paint the ground than it does to paint the picture. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Preparation. Yeah. yeah. Question. If you, okay, could you talk more about if a painting is simple, it's of the moment, but if it's complicated, it will last. I'm not sure that's what he said, but. Well, I think that I think that painting has to do with uh, different things, and a, a, a good painting, they like to have like, well, at a simple level, you, in a contemporary thing, you have five different audience looking at a painting. They all see a different painting. Mm. You got it. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. You like a painter looks at it and says, wow. A dealer says, I can sell this. <laughs> a museum parent says, this is a part of history. <laughs> you know, a writer says, yeah. wow, that's a crazy image. I can write something about it. <laughs> so they're all seeing something a little, a little different. So a painting that's uh, really simple it would be like something that's very beautiful and it's, it's decorative. So it's, it's like one dimensional. And it'll usually go out with the couch. When you get rid of the couch, to get rid of the <laughs> You get painting. rid of the painting. But it was real good when it was new. <laughs> but the symbol, too, that you put in it is also part of that. Part of the painting moves around. Yeah. Different things to different people. Right. And you have a lot of symbolism, or symbols, in your... I have your, a lot of symbols there. They move in around. Your, yeah. In your paintings. Other questions? Right here. Emily. The depth of surface. Yes, it's, well, it, the, the physical thing has to do with oil paint, where you have, um, uh, it's not really opaque, and my paint is put on very thin. So you have the uh, depth is from the, coming from the light going into the, to the whites and coming back out. So you have a, uh, a rich surface. If you look at the color, you know, in reproductions, it looks like it could be chalky. Mm -hmm. But if you see one of the paintings with those light tones, it's never chalky. Yes, right, it's true. Because of the surface. One of the things that, that um, uh, the thing of substance, I think, has to do with the quality, of the, the specific thing of painting having some substance, I think that's one of the things that uh, I think, as a physical substance, my paintings have. Wait a minute, substance, substance define it, it, it. Yeah, it's, 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 it has some substance to, the, to it. Something, some, People could put the same color on, and it would be tentative. Oh. More tentative, or more gestural. But I think the, the things have substance on them. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with the paint. That has to do with the painting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Over here. Your right hand glove fell to shreds by the second half of the painting, and that was yeah, emblematic was, of the energy. Oh, the boot went fell apart. Yeah. yeah, they usually <laughs> very often fall apart. <laughs> you don't realize. I it, started off neat, and it ends up sloppy. <laughs> <laughs> we have quite time for one more question, and then we have to let Alex go. Yes. With New York as a backdrop and your age, did you ever get into a circle with Will Barnett? Huh? Did you ever know Will Barnett? Yeah. He, he, he was the teacher in Cooper when I was there. And he was doing Indian blankets <laughs> painting. He was a dear, dear man. A very sweet guy. Yeah, yeah. But he was like an abstract artist. And I think his figuration comes out of my paintings. It comes out of my paintings. Of your paintings, yeah. the figuration. Yeah. 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 He just died a year ago, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Well, Alex Katz, this has been a true pleasure. Thank you so much for coming to Lincoln Theater, really. Thank you all for coming.